Check, 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 check. Yes. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. This is cool theater. It's a beautiful. Yeah. It's very nice. The uh, Grand, uh, Grand, uh, Grand Vision Foundation, which is a, a foundation here in San Pedro, which I'm on board of, they've done a, lot, a really good job of restoring it and giving all the, developing all the funds and putting it together. So it holds up pretty well, I gotta say. So, um, did you guys enjoy the film? <laughs> 20 years in, it holds up pretty well. It's an old movie, man. <laughs> did you notice the credits that edited on film? That was like the last time <laughs> John and I ever edited a movie on film. I think the next film we did halfway through, we just said, fuck this, and we went to have it. <laughs> so, this was it, but... Uh, so 20 years, uh, The Usual Suspects, uh, 1995, it was your first major feature film uh, that you did. You did a, a film with Christopher McQuarrie before that called Public Access. How did you two get together? What was your, your relationship? Uh, when we were tiny children, our parents ran for local office together in New Jersey. Really? So there were signs all over New Jersey that actually said Singer, McQuarrie, Cahill, and Mount. Those were the four candidates. They were Democrats. They lost but nonetheless, they ran together, and I, this was 1976, and I, I, remember, um, I remember the campaign, and I remember fearing my mom would win and become a public, like have a public life, and I wouldn't see her. Um, but I supported her, and, and Alan McCory, uh, Chris's father, and, uh, and, uh, and then Chris and I, the real reason, the real way that we, we bond, so we always knew each other as little kids, but we bonded because he, um, stole a pack of, a carton of cigarettes for someone else he didn't smoke, and uh, a pack of Skittles from the local Acme, and got arrested. And because he was a minor, they couldn't put him in jail, so instead he was, uh, for an entire summer, Chris was, um, uh, he had a curfew, so he had to be home by seven o'clock. And uh, Ethan Hawke was a friend of ours. We had a whole bunch of like, people who grew up in our neighborhood that now have gone on to do stuff, Brandon Boyce and some other people, a screenwriter. And, um, and I, I had made short films with Ethan and I, so I knew Chris, and, and Chris and I had made some short films, uh, war films in my backyard. <laughs> but suddenly he was curfewed, and apparently like, all his friends abandoned him. And I was like the only one who came over every night and sat with him and watched TV and talked and we started writing stories together, or he wrote stories. And at that time he was writing prose, and I really loved his writing uh, of, of prose. He, I think he wanted to become a novelist. And, um, and that's, that's how when we forged our relationship uh, and our, our partnership. And it began there, and uh, I called him in to do Public Access, which is the film that won Sundance in 93, um, which he co-wrote, uh, and then, um, and then uh, and Unusual Suspects, the idea for this movie came because he and our friend Dylan Cussman, who was an actor from the Poet Society, um, were online to see a movie at Sundance while we were there with public access, and they came up with this idea for a movie poster with five guys in the lineup, and uh, the title would be The Usual Suspects, All of You Can Go to Hell. <laughs> that was it. There was no twist, there was no nothing. And they pitched this to me, and I said, oh, well, maybe the Japanese who gave us money for public access, because we won the Sundance Film Festival, will give us more money if we do a cheap crime film. And now that Tarantino's kind of broken out with, uh, uh, what was it, the Reservoir Dogs, maybe we could, it's a no-brainer. So we developed the script for this movie, nine drafts, six months, lots of fights. <laughs> At one point I threw the script at his head and I said, you fucking directed. <laughs> um, uh, there was a scene that he wanted to keep in the movie. Uh, if I describe it to you, you won't make believe that it was in the It's called the shit scene. It's where like McManus is, like gets into a fight and decides to win the fight by covering him, by shitting in his hands and covering himself in the shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I just said, the shit scene. I'm not sending the script out with that scene in it. <laughs> and then Brandon Boyce, is, you know, and then we had this whole odyssey in LA and it was going on and on and then Brandon Boyce actually had an idea. He said, you gotta truncate that. So then I went to Chris and I said, how about McManus has a friend in LA named Redfoot? It's cut to the Korean friendship bell and there we were. And so then we then kind of timed out. Um, but it went through that period about, as I said, nine drafts uh, over about six months. We sent it to over 50 companies all of them passed. 
including the two that eventually financed the movie, Spelling and Polygram. Because we put together a cast, and then they're like, all right, we'll do it. <laughs> well, let's talk about the script a little bit, because uh, this uh, film holds a special place in this town's heart, because obviously it was filmed in and around here. And, I love it. Yeah, and we love seeing the, the Korean friendship bell on screen. It looked beautiful. Yeah, the um, boat, the whole boat was the part whole, of the yeah, boat, seeing the whole, the half the movie was shot in paper. So how did two guys from New Jersey even know where San Pedro exists we to end up putting that in a script? <laughs> we just needed an industrial port, really? and, uh, and we knew that this was a great place to park. Um, and originally the boat was supposed to be really small, like they go into the hull of it, and they're like, there's no coke, or something, or whatever. <laughs> and then we found this 220-foot minesweeper that the Kennedys used to own, and I think they converted it into a yacht at one point. And then, so we transported that boat to San Pedro, and we shot these scenes on short summer nights, which were very difficult. You, know, you have very few hours of nighttime to shoot in. And up in the middle of shooting, someone made some anonymous phone call that there were either drugs or guns on our boat. So suddenly, I now have men running around with machine guns, and suddenly the ATF shows up. The police show up with real machine guns and real shotguns. And then I'm suddenly, we better put ours away so there's no confusion. And, um, and then they came and boarded the boat. And we had to stop shooting. And I went for a walk around San Pedro, like around the, the port, and just uh, by myself, rewriting the third act if they shut us down. Like, how do I finish up this battle? Or whatever? You just, I'm, I've seen this movie once in 20 years, so you know it better than I do right now. Um, but, but it was gonna, I just was just, you know, when little problems happen, I freak out and I scream at people and shit. When like a big problem like this happens, I'm just like, oh, okay, it'll be a different movie. <laughs> and, and then someone called the mayor of Los Angeles and woke him up. And uh, woke, and woke up the mayor and said, we're, 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 the, the, these, these enforcement people are coming in, they're killing us, we don't have drugs, we don't have guns on our boat, except the fake guns, which were actually real. Um, but they're, you know, we had a prop guy there, he was safe and everything. And, um, and uh, in a matter of about 30 minutes, we were back and we were rolling again. And then, you know, but, but you know, we shot this entire movie in 35 days. Oh, wow. 33 days in LA and San Pedro, and then two days in New York City. So by the time I was shooting in New York, I was like sleeping while I was shooting. I was so tired. <laughs> we, you know, we had an 18 hour, the, the whole Saul Berg heist in the parking garage um, was an 18 hour shoot day, and my location manager quit because he said, you have violated my location, and fuck you, and I was like, oh my god. And I remember, I remember the Carl Bressler, who's a, a below the line agent, played actually the Saul Bird character, and the way he takes a bullet hit in the head is, they take a blowgun, and they blow a, um, a paintball, a red paintball at your fucking forehead. <laughs> and, and, and he said, Brian, is that safe? And I said, well, I'm a movie director, my eyes are my life, to prove to you it's safe, I'll do it. So I sat there, and the guy fired the thing from a distance in the center of my eye. So I had a bullet hole in my head. With, that's what it looked like. And then Chris Farley, the comedian, decided to visit set that night <laughs> because he was friends with one of my cast members. I don't remember which one. And I wanted to meet him because I was such a fan. And then I walked up to him forgetting that I had this bullet hole in my head. <laughs> and then Chris Farley's looking at me like, who the fuck are you, A and B? Why do you have a bullet hole in your head? And then he made a comment about it. That's my memories of that. And the, and the location had been quitting on me. Because <laughs> I shot 18 hours, but I had to finish the scene. Oh my gosh. Um, you do those things when you're uh, younger. You, you make the bigger movies then. Studios like that. <laughs> uh, can we talk a little bit about the casting of this film? Because this film has an absolutely amazing cast. Um, obviously, Kevin Spacey ended up winning the Oscar that year for this role. Um, and Benicio Del Toro, I mean, these were people who just really were semi-unknown at the time. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, specifically maybe Benicio Del Toro's role, the mumbler, yeah. like, how did that all come about? Is that a choice of his own? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, I'll tell you exactly how, uh, that's, uh, um, Kevin Spacey had just done a movie of which I visited the set of, uh, called, uh, Swimming with Sharks, which, um, great film. Uh, it's great film. I rewatched it, I showed it to my assistant recently. Like, why would I show that to my assistant? <laughs> That's the worst why would you, you show any of that to your assistant? It gives him terrible ideas. <laughs> I think very have seen it. It's all about 
Yeah. Well, you see the movie, it's fucking great. But um, uh, it was written by an angry and directed by George Wang, who I think worked for like Scott Rudin and other people like <laughs> reputations and stuff. And um, anyway, so I was on the set of that movie and I met Benicio and it was um, Kevin who recommended him. So he came in for a meeting and he said, Brian, I'm not good at audition. I'll suck. If I audition for you, I'm going to suck. So, you know, we, 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 you know, the way if you want to hire me, I'll do a character. You like the character, we do the character. You don't like the character, we'll do another character. <laughs> and I'm thinking, like, I'm shooting like three weeks. Like, if I don't like the character, I'm, I'm screwed. Okay, so then, then what happens is we, we do the scene in the pool, pool room, I guess. That, that was the first scene where he showed up mumbling. And he had gone out with Macquarie the night before and Postlethwaite and they all got incredibly drunk and they went swimming and they were at this hotel. So I thought maybe this was some joke they, they kind of conjured up. Or maybe it's not a joke, maybe it's his choice. So I better not like, ha ha, I better... So I walked up to him and I said, are you going to do the whole role that way? And he goes, yeah, unless you don't want me to. And I went, and quickly, like, I, I had to use the mental director computer. Unfortunately, I had developed the script with Chris, so I was very intimate with the script. Um, does anything this character say have any relevance or any importance? <laughs> and then I realized, no, his only purpose is to die. <laughs> and I, I, but that had to happen in a split second. And I said, oh, okay, you can do it. Uh, sure. And, but I wrote two lines myself in the movie to accommodate the audience. Because the problem is if an audience sees a doctor mumbling, the audience will be like, uh, honey, I don't, what is he saying? You know, so I put two lines in. One is in the prison cell where I think Kevin Pollack, again, you've seen the movie recently, I have not. Um, I think Kevin Pollack says, what did you say? Meaning, letting the audience know, we know he mumbles. And there was another line that my friend David Duncan uh, plays the cop, you can't see his face, he's in the back of his head, who says, you know, stand forward and give the line you've been given, hand me the keys, you fucking cocksucker. And so when Benicio did it, he, he, he mumbled it and did his thing. And, uh, and so I, and my friend David Duncan didn't really know who was in the movie. He had no idea Gabriel Byrne was gonna come walking across the screen, like he freaked out. And he just showed up like off a plane, and then I said, sit here, you're going to be a cop, you're going to say these lines. And then I wrote one line on his script, I wrote, again, in English. So when the Latin guy in the middle talks, just say again in English, and you're kind of a racist, so I think this will work for you. And I said, they shouldn't have said that. But uh, he's a good guy, he's a really good guy, he's a father now, and I should say um, but, he, um, um, but, but kind of like, we're all from Jersey, so we all you know, kind of, you know, anyway. So, <laughs> so, um, so suddenly the actors come walking out, and he's like, these are movie stars, sort of. And I'm like <laughs> talking to them. And then it freaked him out, but he said the line, he said, again, in English. Benicio wasn't expecting that. Again, that helps the audience understand we're not supposed to understand what he's saying because he mumbles. So those two lines I put in for that purpose. Benicio didn't expect the line to happen, so he said, I mean, the keys, you fucking so what the fuck? And the other guy. And then someone like farted or something. And then, then they, 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 the, actors, the actors in the lineup could not get their shit together. Um, and we never got a full take of the lineup scene as it was written. So all that laughter and that banter and hitting each other and all that was an accident. Um, but it was a happy one because it helped create a, a camaraderie between the suspects. So we kind of get the sense that they. They, they, they knew each other. They had a previous, uh, they, they understood who each other were. Right, it communicated incredibly well on the screen, so yeah, what a great scene. Um, of course, this film is known for its amazing, the twist at the end, if you will, yeah. the famous twist. Um, and I'm curious what your opinion, is. when you were developing the script, obviously the, this came about uh, in, the, in the development process, but what was your mindset Yours and Christopher's mindset going in creating this, well, this it, twist at the end. Was it, 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 it came late. He was about 40 or 50 pages in the script. Mm -hmm. And it was basically about a bunch of felons who meet in the lineup and go off on an odyssey of crime. And that was all that it was going to be. 
And then Chris called me when I was at my, my father's house, and he said, hey, I have this idea, because he was working on a law firm, and he, there was a uh, bulletin board in front of him, was, uh, Skokie, Illinois, actually a bulletin board manufacturing company. And he said, how about he takes the whole story off the bulletin board? And I remember saying the very words to him on the phone, and I said, now that's a reason to make this movie. That's, now, now that's something to work towards. Um, and then it literally, those were the words I said. So then we began working towards that. So we had a cut of the movie, which I showed reel by reel to my agent at the time, Victoria Wisdom, and my lawyer, who's still my lawyer to this day, David Feldman. And I showed it to him at my editor's house at night, reel by reel, on what was something called a moviola, which <laughs> you won't even know what that is. Well, some of you are the age, you remember. Um, so I showed the film to them reel by reel, and it didn't have all those cuts and flashbacks and voices and, and all that montage at the end. It just had basically him yelling and him accusing of you know, Keaton, this guy, or so say, Keaton, Keaton, this, Keaton, that, Keaton. And then suddenly he looks at the bullet board, drops his cup, and then suddenly uh, he, the, the foot unfolds. And it, the movie kind of died because it was all script, it was all talk. So you were told what was happening, but you, you didn't feel it, you didn't experience it. So my editor was cheap, so he didn't want to air condition the whole house. I demanded the air condition, the portion that we would edit in. So there were big plastic sheets up, and I slept in a sleeping bag next to the moviola, um, inside the air condition part of the house, uh, next to the, the, the sanding machine. And I woke up at eight in the morning with an epiphany, and I said, and then he poked, and I remember Ottman, who's my editor composer, and to this day still edits and composes uh, my films, or most of them. And he, uh, he poked his head through and said, can we get back to work? And I said, John, I need you to go through the movie, or have your assistant, or have somebody, and find every sound bite, every image, anything, that could convince the audience that Gabriel Byrne is the villain of this movie. And then, I need you to go back into the movie and find every sound bite and every piece of scrap that will then finally convince the audience that it is Kevin Spacey who is the true villain. I probably had a feeling I was gonna do this because you'll notice in the montage there's a shot of Gabriel Byrne firing a weapon, wearing a fedora, at the space where he's meant to be sitting. Gabriel had no idea why I was asking him to do that this night. He doesn't even like guns, so I just told him I was a big Miller's Crossing fan. Just fuck, shoot the gun. Just put on the fedora, shoot the gun at my camera. And he's like, oh, okay, bang. I got, finally got a good take. Um, then, so then we cut this montage together that made you feel that Gabriel Byrne was the villain, which is a lie, it's a deception. And no movie had really done that before. Um, uh, Sixth Sense kind of did it after us, but, but we just lied to the audience and then told them the truth at the end visually, using these sound cues. And the last part of that story is that it was cut together, the mag was just laying all over the floor, it was chewed up by John's cat, it was like scratched on the rug, it was, the, you know, the, the mag sound, it was on magnetic strips. It was all just taped together. And so we played it in the test screenings, or the early screen, early, like for us screenings. And then we decided to go to the original DATs, the original digital sound recordings, and then clean it up and put it in the surrounds so it's all around you. And for some reason it just didn't work. It didn't have any emotional resonance. It didn't have that punch at the end. And it didn't work. So what, you're, see, what you saw tonight is just literally not mixed. It, it's literally the, um, just the mag cut together. And a lot of them are alternate takes that were not used in the film. The body of the film, there are takes that are different takes because it's a different story, it's a fantasy, it's all made up. So, so that was kind of a fun thing we could do, and um, uh, that's a story about how the ending materialized. In fact, Chris was shocked when he saw it. He was like, wow, where did those cuts come from? And I was like, well, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it works. He's like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, Chris and I are like family, so we just <laughs> fuck, with, fuck with each other constantly. Uh, in the... Uh, when you were shooting down here, did you spend a lot of time in San Pedro at all? Did you uh, end up hanging out down here? Did you, did you uh, sleep down here or anything when you were shooting down no, here? No, I commuted. You commuted. Actually, yeah, which was very interesting, today's commute here was like a flashback. I shot a pilot here recently, 
I don't remember which pilot, which is really bothering me. But I do remember <laughs> driving past the building where his foot, the, where the, the police station. And I stopped the car and I said, I think that's the building. And I got out and I took a picture and I tweeted it. But um, uh, that was the last time I was in San Pedro. Before then, uh, <clears throat> it, it was just to shoot the movie. And so when we were driving down here, I commented to my sister Ryan, I said, this, this is like a flashback to my commute to, 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 um, to Usual Suspects. And sometimes they were night shoots. I, mean, I was commuting, in, well, not in the dark, but you know, in some setting and stuff. And the factory with the fire thing. And it was like bringing back memories, this whole journey. So no, the, a lot of the main street here, I've never been to this theater. I know the Warner's Bell, I, I, mean, I know some history here. But, but, but I've not spent real time here. You know, I, I go to the East Coast a lot to see my family, and then uh, I'm, I'm in West Hollywood, that's where I live, from Malibu. Uh, what, one of the uh, great scenes in this film is obviously the uh, Korean Bell scene, which anybody who's been over to the Korean Friendship Bell knows, it is constantly windy. It is constantly, um, it's a real tough place to, to, it's a great place to fly a kite, but it's probably an incredibly hard place to shoot a film. I'm sure we've done that. Uh, <laughs> but we did it. Everybody but, but, starts blowing. And, oh, yeah. yeah I, it's I'm sure we've done We probably yeah. dubbed it. I, I couldn't tell. I have to rewatch it to tell you if we dubbed it or if we just used the raw sound. Um, there was a moment where Peter Green flicked a cigarette and it actually went into Stephen Baldwin's eye. <laughs> and then he dove and broke the scene and said, Oh, my God, my God. But I had two cameras rolling. So I was able to actually use this egregious nearly blinding event and Baldwin was like did you, did you get it because like i just experienced it so if, please use it if you got it and uh and i said i think it the b camera got it and uh, green didn't get in the way he got in the way of one of the cameras because there's a blue there exists a blooper reel from this film that you have to see because originally kaiser Sose's name wasn't kaiser Sose, it was kaiser sume it was named after chris's boss of a law firm and uh yeah you imagine a lawyer named sume <laughs> and, uh, and that was the name, and when I changed it to Soze, Chaz Paul and Terry, who had memorized the script, was like, please don't do that, oh my god, please don't do that. So I have a hundred takes of people going, there is no Kaiser Suman, Soze, fuck! <laughs> like, we have like a montage of that. So in this gag reel, which exists somewhere, I, I have to find it, it's in like my basement or something. Well, it's funny that uh, cigarette flipping scene, I was in here when it, it went into... Uh, when we saw it tonight, and everybody in the audience, uh, there was a huge reaction, an audible reaction when the uh, cigarette got flicked in his eyes. It was great. Yeah, it was real. It was totally real, yeah. yeah. yeah and Peter Green it too. And was mortified. Peter Green thought he blinded Stephen Baldwin. He was like, <laughs> he was freaked out. Um, that's how I went with a few moments on movies like that. Was it hard to keep the secret of the ending of the film, even back in 1995? I, I assume a film today, you couldn't get away with something like that. Nobody knew what this film was. This, yes. film, this film came out of nowhere. The only hope, oh, oh, we, it, it's, we had a very rare experience. I was able to test a finished film. Normally when we have, for the X-Men films, because they're so hot, we can't do energy tests. So we do what's called friends and family screens. For, um, for usual suspects, we do what's called the NRG test. National Research Group test. We have a guy who runs it. He still does it to this day. He's great. And, um, we finished the movie with its final score and final mix, and then tested that. It's a very rare thing. Usually you have a temp score, and your effects aren't done, and it's like a fucking mess. This was a finished film, and it had three scenes in it that dragged. A spacey monologue, a fight in the boat, and something I can't even remember. But, but I did I, I had to pee so badly that when the screening was over, I just ran to the bathroom. As I came out of the bathroom, a guy came behind his girlfriend and basically said, hey, I'm Kaiser Sose, and he grabbed her. And I went, oh, like the name stuck in his head, like he's still, like he's in the movie. Oh, and we got an applause. I went back into the actual negative and removed those three scenes, which meant I actually had to cut the negative. Cut negative, it's freaky because you're cutting actual negative, you're losing frames. So, um, and they tightened up the film, I think it made the film, you know, kind of work. It was the right, it, it, it didn't drag. Um, but I even remember all the monologues that I cut. I, I could recite this, it's, it's so weird because when you develop a script, you can actually remember, like, the, the monologue the way it was supposed to be versus. Yeah, going off on a tangent. 
Where do you have memories are coming back? This is 20 years ago, so I'm living in the X Men apocalypse world now. Yeah. Is there anything about the name Kaiser Soze? Uh, yeah. Came from? Yeah. Well, some say his father was German, so he's from Turkey. <laughs> so Kaiser means king, and Soze means talk too much or to be too verbal. So it's king talk too much or king verbal. So it's for, so yeah. it's, it's kind of a clever little thing that Chris came up with and called me with an on-location scout, and I said, fine, good. <laughs> Actually, he was afraid to show his boss the script because Kaiser says he kills his whole family. And his boss, his boss said, I know you and your buddy are going to make a great movie. I still want to affect my law practice if you use my real name. Kind of like, imagine, like, you know, like Darth Vader and Johnny Cochran approach the bench, you know what I mean? It's like, it's that kind of thing. In the end, Kaiser Sume saw the movie and actually said, I would have been proud to have you, if you had used my real name, I would have been happy with it, but so it's, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so 20 years looking back, I mean, this, this film obviously uh, set you on a trajectory. You did, uh, uh, according to your filmography, you, did re you went at people after this, um, yeah. a great film with Brad Renfro and uh, Ian McKellen. Yeah, and sure. um, then you went into the X-Men films, yeah. which you really jumped into wholeheartedly, and now that's kind of been your thing now for the past, uh, 15, I don't know, yeah, yeah a long, long time. Um, any final thoughts about The Usual Suspects itself? I mean, the film, you're proud that I, I'm sure it's a great well, you, film. You, 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 I, I only knew it would be bad, do you want to get that? No, I only knew it would, I only knew it would be better than public access because I had better actors. Right, you know, I had these really wonderful actors. Otherwise, you have no sense that the movie's going to have any longevity or a classic nature or a cult classic nature. So none of that uh, ever occurred to me. But at the Cannes Film Festival, when we premiered it in the Palais uh, in the afternoon, it was not in competition, I saw it on a giant screen. And then they hit me and the cast with a spotlight. And there was an eight-minute standing ovation. Or ovation. Maybe they didn't stand. I don't remember. But I remember that moment, and then I remember being at the Cannes Film Festival, walking across the lawn of the Majestic Hotel, and an elderly woman grabbed me, like found me, grabbed me, and I looked like a kid, I looked like a child. It was like weird directing, <laughs> I tried to grow a goatee and be all like mature and just a joke. <laughs> and, um, and she grabbed me by the arm, and she said, John Houston would be so proud of you. And that moment was a moment I said, oh, this movie may have, um, uh, may have uh, more growth than just a uh, film. And our press days went from two days of press to five days of press, uh, overnight after the first screening, which also is a sign that obviously you've created something that now has caught some fire. That was a can. It was released a month early in France, and then I went with my boyfriend to see it in France, and we saw it on the Champs Elysees, and it, it was they had French subtitles, and I watched it, and he already had the pleasure of telling me in Deauville how much a couple hated public access, my first film in French, so he had no problem telling me that. He's, so, so after this, when the movie was over, I just oh, people started gabbing in French in the theater, and I, I said. What are they saying? What's going on? And Fred, his name is Frederick. He, he said, um, he said, it's good, it's all good. It's all good. And I was like, okay, good. And then it came out in the United States, and then, you know, I, you know, Gramercy didn't quite know how to fully release it. It never saw more than 800 theaters. It, it made about 25 million domestically, but then it became something more in video, and then it won its Oscars, and then it, it's become something different in its post-life. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Um, we have a few minutes left. Maybe we have some questions from the audience. Uh, Want to ask uh, Mr. Singer while we're here? Do we have the uh, microphone? Ask me anything. <laughs> well, while well, they're doing that, I got you in front of me here. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you a question or two about X-Men Apocalypse. Comes out next year. Yeah. Um, it's the next big film. Mm -hmm. um, those of you who may have seen the Entertainment Weekly cover that had uh, uh, Oscar Isaac as Apocalypse and yeah. uh, everybody on the What's the status? I mean, have you, have you locked it? Is it ready? No, it's not locked at all. Yeah. We're, 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 yeah, it cuts a little long right now, but I, I think it's going to be a longer X-Men movie. The movie, the X-Men movies, I usually keep under two hours. This one, I may actually let be a longer movie because it's a, it's sort of a wrap-up of six movies. 
It's kind of a wrap up of X Men 1, 2, 3, First Class, Days of Future Past. This is sort of, and there's even a homage at the end as a scene. Um, it gets, it's going to get spoiled because they decided to use it in the trailer, which comes out in like six months, but it's a really cool trailer. Um, but but, uh, but it, it kind of, um, it's kind of a, you know, a wrap up of, um, of, uh, of, of, of six movies. Yeah. So, so it might run a little bit long, but, but, but it's not boring. I mean, it, it'll, I mean it's, it's, it's like, film. It's not yeah, it'll keep going. And new characters and young characters and romances that, and rekindled romances between Z uh, Xavier and uh, Moira McTaggart, mm. uh, who played by Rose Byrne, who was amazing, and, uh, and um, Michael Fassbender did something uh, so wonderful in this movie. He, um, and I just saw him in Jobs last night. I, I just, uh, holy shit. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to oversell the Steve Jobs movie, but Jesus. I, he, <laughs> oh, shit. He, could, he should win the, the thing, the, the Oscar for this. <laughs> um, I, I literally, I, it's, it's amazing, and it's, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not talking about this movie, I, I, talk about, I, I love talking about other movies, I, like, I can talk about like Jaws forever, <laughs> um, but um, no, Fassbinder does something in this movie where uh, he has the scene, and um, he asked me not to call cut, um, and when the scene was over, he continued and did something that made me cry in the tent, I've never done that before. My uh, head of my company, uh, James Ta uh, Jason Taylor, um, grabbed a Kleenex. Simon Kinberg, the writer who has n no emotions at all, actually <laughs> became emotional. Um, uh, it, 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 it was so beautiful. I, I, I've never seen an actor do this for me. And he just took the scene to a whole other level. And, and it's this heartbreaking scene, not a typical comic book movie scene at all. So let's hope it makes the cut. But after he did it, I, I went into the woods and I went up to him and I hugged him and I said, thank you, Michael, thank you for that gift. Now I need you to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> could, could you, this time, have, and, he did, and he did it and he fucking rocked it again with full emotion. This guy's amazing. He, got, he can go from like the most like emotionally devastating moment to like, you know, like breakdancing to blurred lines, you know, <laughs> in between takes. Like he's, uh, he, he's probably he McAvoy and, and, and uh, my villain uh, Oscar Isaac um, are among the three greatest living actors in cinema in their age category uh, by far, and um, they will not be lauded or awarded because they're in an X Men movie and comic book movies just don't get that kind of shit. But they deliver some extraordinary performances, particularly in X-Men Apocalypse, because the movie is, it, it's very emotional, and it's a lot, uh, and a lot of uh, pathos about the characters and their relationships. Very cool. We're excited. It opens in May of next year, so. Yeah, Memorial Day. Awesome. Yeah. So we have the, audio, the microphone yeah. on the audience. Does anybody have a, yes. Here. No, that was just an editing. That was John. John just felt the arrest was boring of Benicio, and he just wanted to speed it up. Literally, he said, "Like I, I gotta get through this thing pretty quick." <laughs> the plane. Well, and by the way, the plane. Do you notice it drops two engines? It's like it's it's a seven forty seven that becomes a DC ten. It's like, <laughs> dude, we got footage. We got. You know, we were at the airport. We were like, okay. I know. I am happy. I did one thing. Um, emotionally, um, I shot myself, I operated, and I shot both the Twin Towers and I shot the Empire State Building that was in New York City. And in the editing, I had to make a choice uh, which building to use. And, uh, and because of the nostalgia, because of what happened, uh, the tragedy, um, I'm, I'm pleased that I chose the Twin Towers. And there's a bird flew by and we put a little sound effect. And, and I, I'm, I'm pleased I made that choice for the, for the, um, yeah, that establishing shot's beautiful. There's Someone's a question back there. Somebody, uh, raise your hand. Monaco, run and stick a microphone in your face. <laughs> hey. <laughs> I don't have anyway. <laughs> so you've done all these uh, high-profile, um, big-budget films. Do you think you'll ever go back to low-budget indie or something really grand? 
That was supposed to be Valkyrie until Tom Cruise said, I'll play the lead role. <laughs> <laughs> Valkyrie was supposed to be an international cast made for $26 million, like all dialogue, just completely independent, like at UA, Tom Cruise would own a UA, you know, and then suddenly Tom was like, I was like, Tom, you, you kind of look like Stauffenberg. And he's like, I do. Let me think about that. <laughs> then the budget was $100 million. And uh, we had air, real airplanes, real P-40s, real all live explosions, Tom does all his own stunts, the whole thing. But, you know, it enabled us to have the visual effects of his missing fingers and hand and do these things um, that, I, that I could never have done if Tom wasn't the star of the picture. So, um, the way I exercise my independent side is I do pilots, I do TV pilots. And, and like, I did the pilot for House, and I, I exactly produced that show, and I've probably made more money off that than all my movies combined. <laughs> So there's a method to that madness, but it also forces me to, to shoot fast and remember the old days. But yes, at some point I will do a smaller movie, I will, I will step back. But right now I'm in that rarefied air, that rarefied place that few of us as directors are, that can get movies greenlit north of $107 million. And when you have that ability and you're in that place, and maybe there's only 20 of us right now, you, you, you try to take advantage of it. You try to play it out. Young girl. Is that a young girl? Yes, one second. Is my glasses working? Um, I'm actually an actress, and when I grew up, I want to be also a director. And is there any advice that you can give me? Yes, one, obviously acting classes, continue acting classes if you enjoy acting. I, I don't know much about acting, I'm not an actor, I suck. Um, but, but as far as directing, start with writing. Write scripts. Write them yourself. Um, if you have a partner, write them with your partner. But that gets you used to the notion of storytelling on the page and write them in script form. So if you need education, just read a script. It'll show you the format of how to write one or use the screenwriting program that you probably have on your computer that I never had because you're young and not old. Um, <laughs> and then, as you move into filmmaking, start with short films, which you can make on your iPhone or video, which are cheap, which I did not have that option. It was like three minutes of Super 8 film cost $13. For you, you can shoot at nine hours for zero money. So do that. Get an editing program for your computer and start making short films. And then the last piece of advice I would say is find uh, collaborators, like find partners, people to, like, to work with you who, who, want, who share the same vision as you, a producing partner maybe who is behind you or a co-writer. Because film is a collaborative art form, unlike painting, unlike writing. And if you can't convince somebody to like bond with you and support you and work with you for free, then you're not going to be able to convince somebody to work with, give you millions of dollars. So, so those are the three steps, I think, from your age to the process of, of making films. Um, and, and you have the blessing of today's technology, which is my iPhone 6 looks better than any usual suspects. So that's my advice. That's great advice. I think we have time for uh, time we got here. Yeah, about one more question. Yes, I was curious as to why the choice of Hungarian other than some language. Completely arbitrary. It's like let's pick something. Hungarian. It sounds exotic and creepy. <laughs> One more it's actually Hungarians actually love me. I have a lot of Hungarian friends, but now, but at the time, that was probably Chris's idea. I blame Chris. Another question. <laughs> yes. There's one, two, three. That's the three. Three. Okay. Oh, unless you all have to go to the bathroom. Okay. One second. I know I do, but I'm still sitting. Mine don't be fast. Um, were you involved with Battle Creek? Yeah, I did. I love Battle Creek. Oh, Will so ever sorry. come back? No, sadly, no. We had 13 episode commitment. Um, I, shot, I directed the pilot. I love those actors. Uh, oh, Josh Jamal and, 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 and all of them. They're, they're, there was the loveliest cast you could ever imagine. So dedicated, and uh, and it, it breaks my heart. But the problem, I think, the problem with that was 
It's at CBS, but it was produced by Sony. And so what happens is, is you get these situations where another studio is producing it, so there's no incentive for the network to keep it on the air because they don't see the profits in the syndication of it. Sony does. So like when I made House, do you know who sees the biggest money from House? Not Fox. What was on Fox for eight years? It's NBC Universal because they paid for it. That show happened to catch fire and have 25 million viewers. This never had a shot. CBS, they, they, they advertised on their own network to two million people, and it just, it just never had a shot. Where uh, Elementary, which was one of my favorite shows, is the same, I think it's on the same network, and less people saw it than Battle Creek, but they own it, so they get the syndication. So I think that's, the stuff, that's where we suffered. And, uh, on that show, but I really appreciate you saying that on behalf of the crew, the cast, uh, who I adore. I, uh, I adore that, 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 that cast. I wrote them all when the show got, you know, when it was over, I wrote them all letters, which I rarely do, um, just because they were so fabulous. And Battle Creek has a special place in the heart of San Pedro. Those of you who never saw the show or were familiar with it, they turned uh, 7th Street into uh, downtown Michigan, or, or Michigan, they turned the uh, liquor store next to Godmother's into uh, a location for the uh, series. So Brian shot the pilot for that series. Um, yeah, uh, Sir Duncan. Uh, she had a question. We'll start with her. Oh, sorry, she had. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Good evening, Brian. Good evening. My name is Sadie Gello. I'm a French actress from Paris. Um, I wanted to know, how open are you with minori minorities in your project, and how open are you in terms of accent? Because I've heard a lot of things Incredibly open, I love it. In fact, when I did the pilot for House, I insisted that Jesse Spencer keep his accent. Um, he was an actor, actor for, uh, Australian, but lived in England, so he had a weird fucked up accent. I said, keep it. Um, Hugh Laurie could not keep his accent. He had to be American. But, um, but uh, uh, no, I, I, I love that. But, but I come from my favorite thing in the world. I have two favorite things in the world, uh, in media and television, in movie and television. My favorite movie is Jaws. And my favorite TV show. <laughs> and my favorite TV show is the original Star Trek. And the ambitiousness at that time of having a multi ethnic cast as the, uh, piloting the spaceship in the future, telegraphing the future as being multi ethnic. Think how groundbreaking that is. You know, and by the way, do any of you know who produced Star Trek? Yeah, Lucille Ball. Yeah, these are the productions. So that was Lucille Ball. So I'm very inspired, and I make sure in the X-Men movies, Omar C was in the last one. Um, I, 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 I'm a uh, fan Bing Bing from China. I, I, I'm all over the place uh, internationally. I believe my films, I, I want my films to play globally. And I want accents, I want language, I, want, I, 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 I have mul I, people speaking multiple languages in upco my upcoming film, in X-Men First Class, which I wrote, produced. Uh, 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 Kevin Bacon speaks like three languages. Um, Oscar Isaac speaks Egyptian, Arabic, and English. Like, like, I, I think. Like, like, I, like, we're, like, like, I'm all about that. And I think that Star Trek is, is, is a great pioneer. And also a little a lesser known secret, they were gonna cut Spock from Star Trek because they thought he looked like the devil. <laughs> Except when he put on the ears and that hair, women on the set thought he looked hot. <laughs> so they decided to keep him on the show. And a third known fact is it wasn't gonna get a second season. But then the big letter writing campaign from fans came in saying, oh, sorry, third season, um, saying, please give it a third season, please give it a third season, please Star Trek. It was fake. It was orchestrated by Gene Roddenberry, the creator of the show. <laughs> but somewhere in some building, some executive looked at a spreadsheet and said, how many more people own colored TVs this year than last year? They said 30% or some percentage. How many shows do we have in color? Well, we've got this, we've got that, we, not many, we've got Star Trek. All right, give it another season. So that's how Star Trek got a third season, and now it's a multi-billion dollar franchise. <laughs> Sorry, I had to go from the Star Trek thing. I can talk about Steve Jobs' movie, by the way, I can root it all for you. It's amazing. Uh, so you had a question, sir. Yes. Hi, and, and 
Valkyrie and Sofferberg meets Hitler, you know, that room scene is about 55 to 60 cuts. When went through your mind? Because that's a great memorable. It's a real scene that really happened. Um, I want to show the Berghoff. I want to show the giant picture window. I wanted to slowly introduce Hitler in a strange way with the, with the dog petting. You know, I mean, we saw him already in the film, but, but I wanted him it to be eerie. I wanted him to talk about Wagner because Wagner was an anti-Semite, and Wagner, whose music I love, even though I'm Jewish, <laughs> and he probably would have hated me, um, and gay. Um, I think, uh, I, I wanted to create this sense of eeriness, because I'll tell you why. And that's why there's so many cuts and so many odd angles, and the, when he walks up and signs the document, and uh, it's because in real life, Stauffenberg, the day after D-Day, D-Day, the invasion of Normandy, the end of the war, Hitler was fucked. Stauffenberg went to see Hitler and the Big Six and met them all to sign the Valkyrie Agreement. That actually happened. And he went, and what I didn't, put in the film, but I wanted to encapsulate in the scene with Hitler, is when he went back and told his wife, Stauffenberg went back and said, they're all crazy. Goering has got so much makeup on, he's psychotic. The only one who isn't crazy is Speer, and he's just a fucking architect. And they have, not, they have not recognized the fact that Normandy has just been invaded. They're just oblivious. They're insane. I need to kill this man. And that, that, was, that actually happened. That was a conversation with, with, with Nina von Stauffenberg, with his wife. And we know this. We just documented she died not long ago. So we, we know all of this. And so I wanted to create a scene that would emulate the eerie and creepiness of what he would eventually go tell his wife in real life. So I was inspired by what I didn't put in the movie to craft that scene, I guess. Plus, I love that big fucking window. It's really cool. And by the way, that window goes up and down, so it's like an indoor outdoor room. Hitler, Hitler had an eye for design. Yeah. Well, he, dude, I'm serious. The jack boots, the swastika, which isn't even called a swastika, by the way. It's called a Hattenkreuz. The swastika doesn't mean anything in German. Um, but what's interesting is he created such amazing aesthetic except now it all represents evil. <laughs> and it will for a long time. <laughs> Sorry. On that note, uh, <laughs> uh, I think we're done with the Q&A. Thank you, everybody. Uh, okay, so we'll start. Before we end, uh, Renee O'Connor, who's uh, the co-director of the uh, St. Peter International Film Festival, has a little something uh, she'd like to present to you tonight. I will take it. <laughs> that you have another 20 years oh, in you to share with us on all your stories. This is our Skylight Award. Thank you for coming to the St. Peter. Thank you for coming to the Gentlemen, let's uh, give a round of applause to Brian Sanders. Thank you for coming tonight.